start with this. Well, Derek Chisora had some comments in regards to Usyk, his ascension to the heavyweight division. He says, him and his team, they need to stop juggling balls. It's not a circus. Forget the juggling balls and dancing. This is a boxing match. You know what? I want to have that fight. Yeah, I would take it 100%. What do I think about this situation? I think it's an entirely doable situation, it being that both Usyk and Derek Chisora, in one way, shape, or form, they're both in bed with Matchroom. I'll tell you that if Derek Chisora makes his way past David Price, a fight between Derek and Oleksandr could be billed as a Sky Sports pay-per-view. Yeah, yeah, there are legitimate pay-per-view possibilities over there in the UK in regards to a matchup like this. And I will tell you that Derek Chisora, in spite of having more professional losses than Chaz Witherspoon did, Derek Chisora is actually a better litmus test for Oleksandr Usyk now that he's a heavyweight than Chaz was. Look, Derek Chisora is the UK's no-nonsense bad boy in the heavyweight division. This is not a finesse fighter by any stretch of the imagination. He's a gutting and gritty, rough and tumble kind of fighter. Derek Chisora is not the kind of guy that steps between those ropes looking for a chess match. That's not who he is. This is the kind of guy that's going to continue to pressure you, continue to come forward, let his hands go. He's willing to take one to give one. That's the kind of fighter that he is. And for Usyk in particular, Usyk, who's not the big biggest puncher. I've said it many times. He wasn't the biggest puncher. He wasn't. At cruiserweight, and he certainly isn't that now, at heavyweight. Thus, asserting himself against an aggressive guy like Derek Chisora, trying to get respect out of a guy like that, trying to get that guy to simmer down, take his foot off the gas. For Usyk, it could actually prove to be very difficult. There's a lot of sizzle involved in a fight like this, a lot of intrigue. And I reiterate, this fight, if Derek makes his way past David Price, this fight has genuine pay-per-view possibilities so we can see that this is a fight that Derek is receptive to this is a fight that he's willing to have and the question now is is this a fight that Usyk is willing to have is he receptive to just this proposition we know that Usyk is in line for a title shot he's in line to contend for the WBO title regardless of who wins in December in the Joshua versus Ruiz rematch thing is Eddie Hearn's been letting it be known that the winner of that fight might end up vacating that title because the winner of that fight, they're going to have two mandatories, one via the IBF and another via the WBO. The WBO's mandatory being Usyk, and well, unless the sanctioning bodies, unless the powers that be are expecting the winner of that fight to fight two mandos in one night, there's just not too many ways to reconcile that situation. I'd say, if I had it my way, you know, let's say Joshua wins the fight, gets his belts back, and he so decides to defend the IBF title as opposed to the WBO. A reconciliation that could be reached would be to pay Usyk to step aside so that they can take care of Pulev. You know, the IBF, they're sticklers for their own rules. They abide by them, and I respect that. And it's for this reason I feel that that's the mandatory that should be taken care of first. You know, Pulev was already in position to contest for the red belt before Usyk made his heavyweight debut. Thus, he is more deserving of a title shot than Usyk is. So you take care of Pulev, you pay Usyk to step aside, and in the mean and between time, what Usyk can do is have a little pay-per-view fight with Derek Chisora. I think the people over there in the UK would be happy to see it. I think they'd show up and show out for just such a pay-per-view, for just such a matchup. Seems to make sense to me, you know? Though I'm not sure how much sense it'll make to Usyk and his team because, at least according to Eddie Hearn, what they want, what they have their sights set on, is fighting for a world title. And, you know, unless something can be negotiated to where it'll be Usyk versus Chisora for what could be the vacant WBO, they may not view a Chisora fight as being all that appealing, even in the event that it can be billed as a pay-per-view. That proposition in and of itself has some uh, wrinkles that might need to be ironed out. Because, you know, the UK market, they'd definitely be receptive to a fight like that as a pay-per-view. It would definitely be something that could generate some coin. But the fact that the fight would be built in the, in, in the UK market, well, Derek Chisora might view himself as the A-side in that situation and start making all kinds of demands. These are the kind of wrinkles that a fight like that would have to iron out before it could come into fruition. But better still, it's a proposition that makes sense to me because Usyk hasn't proven anything as a heavyweight. He's made his debut. He fought Chaz Witherspoon. No, cri no criticisms from me. But beating Chaz Witherspoon in whatever fashion you beat him in, that's not, you know, that's not really making a statement to the rest of the weight class because Chaz Witherspoon is not one of the best and brightest fighters there. Thus, beating him doesn't communicate much. Now, beating the likes of a Derek Chisora, I'd say that's a better litmus test. That's a step up from a Chaz Witherspoon. 
And I'd like to see more of Usyk as a heavyweight, you know, make that kind of a statement before he contends for a world title. Because at this point in the junk shore, I'm not sure he's ready for that. And until he has those kinds of fights with those kinds of fighters, we're really just not going to know. We're not going to know until the night of the fight, you know, whether or not Usyk's ready to be a world champion in this division. We just won't know. I think a Derek Chisora fight ahead of a title shot makes a lot of sense. And the same can be said in regards to a Tyrone Spong fight. I also happen to think that a fight like that for Usyk ahead of a title shot makes a lot of sense. Usyk's got to prove himself at this weight. You know, a lot of people are enamored with what he managed to accomplish as a cruiserweight. And I understand that. I'm not denigrating that in the least bit. I'm just saying that what you did at cruiserweight and what's going on now at heavyweight, well, those are two different animals, two different beasts. And Usyk does have a lot to prove in the heavyweight division. And he could prove that with a Chisora. He could prove that with a Spong. And I think that these are the kinds of fights that need to happen before he fights for a world title. I mean, he's still got to make his bones as a heavyweight. That, that's the bottom line. That's, 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 that's what needs to happen. That should be the sequence of events. I mean, you look over at Michael Hunter, a guy who moved up to heavyweight just like Usyk did, but look at what he's done so far, okay? For the seasoned veteran and Alexander Ustinov, an undefeated contender in Sergey Kuzman, and right now, Talks are underway, negotiations are happening, so that Michael Hunter could see himself facing the likes of Alexander Povetkin. Povetkin, who just so happens to be a top 10, a consensus top 10 in the division. This really should be the pecking order for Usyk, you know. Being fast-tracked to a world title opportunity, it could be disastrous, depending on the circumstances. So why rush it? You know, that, that's essentially what I'm communicating, that for his longevity, for his continued success, he might want to take his foot off the gas a bit. Don't go painting a target on your back where there's one there already. I'm sure there are any variety of guys who want to get a piece of Usyk because he's a newbie to the weight. You know, they look at him as a greenhorn to the heavyweight division, like, yeah, you're an Olympic gold medalist. Yeah, you were the undisputed champion at cruiserweight, but at heavyweight, you haven't proven anything. So, you know, there's any variety of fights that I think make sense for Usyk before he fights for a world title. And I understand that he's well within his rights to, 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 to fight for the WBO. I get it. You know, I understand it. I'm not complaining. I just think that... Might be too soon. If it happens in a certain way, it actually makes more sense. I think Usyk has to earn his stripes as a heavyweight. Just one man's opinion. Feel free to disagree. In other news, Bob Arum has revealed some light heavyweight news. Some that we saw coming and some that we didn't. He entertained the idea that Oleksandr Vozda could be squaring off against Zerto Ramirez very soon, given, you know, this weekend's events. And, and Zerto needs a litmus test because as it stands, as a light heavyweight, now that he's campaigning there, the most he's done is beat a very past it Tommy Carpensi. Needless to say, he arrived at light heavyweight, but he hasn't quite made a splash and very little news in regards to what Zerto means to do next. Very little news has been circulating. Thus, a fight with a former champion, the likes of an Oleksandr Vozda, it makes sense. It's, it's, it's a great litmus test. It makes for a great fight. You know, so, so I'm all for that fight. And, and I reiterate, you know, given what's about to go down in the very near future in regards to the WBO title, the title that Kovalev's got but may not have. For too long. I, I'll tell you what I told you before. If Canelo wins that belt, in all likelihood, he doesn't hang on to it. He vacates it. And the guy in line for that belt is Zerto Ramirez. So Zerto Ramirez versus Oleksandr Vozdik sometime one to two fights from now for the for what could be the vacant WBO title that is a real, tangible, and palpable possibility. Yet another light heavyweight matchup that we could be seeing is the likes of former super middleweight contender and title challenger, Jesse Hart, against the likes of the bruising Joe Smith Jr. I like this matchup, I do, though I don't like it as much as a previous matchup that Joe Smith Jr.'s name was tied to. A matchup with the UK zone puncher, Callum Johnson. In all honesty, I feel that a fight between Johnson and Joe Smith Jr. is actually a better matchup than a matchup between Jesse Hart and Joe Smith Jr. Nevertheless, it's a great fight. It's certainly a good litmus test for Jesse Hart, who, you know, he won that fight against Sullivan Barrera, and that's saying something. I mean, that 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 is a credible opponent for a guy moving up to light heavyweight from super middleweight. So you gotta give Jesse that much. However, in terms of the performance, he didn't wow me. You know, he didn't bedazzle me. He didn't arrive at 175 and, you know, make a big splash. He won the fight, it was competitive, and you gotta give him that much. But I think there's more work needs doing before Jesse Hart can convince me that he's some kind of a threat 
to anybody holding a belt. Because as it stands, I'd give any one of the champions. Better Beef. Yep. Kovalev. Yep, him too. Mm-hmm. Bivol. I, I, I'd give any one of them great odds to beat the likes of Jesse Hart. So Jesse Hart, you know, those eggs need more bacon. And, and he can add to that plate with a what you know with what could be a sensational win over the likes of Joe Smith Jr. The thing is, it's not a foregone conclusion that Jesse wins that fight. Joe Smith Jr. is not a finesse fighter. He's not. He's not a hit and not get hit, defensively minded kind of guy. He's not some nuanced fighter. But what Joe Smith Jr. has is concussive punching power. Jesse is not so great a defensive wizard that he can completely offset Joe Smith Jr.'s aggression and punching power. Essentially, it's a matchup that has the potential to be competitive because you're not quite sure if Jesse Hart, you know, won't get himself clipped in there. Joe Smith Jr., he's good for a knockdown. You know, and he's a guy who can really hit. He's got a lot of toughness, okay? This guy did fight with a broken jaw. That's how tough he is, okay? He's not a, you know, he's not just somebody's patsy. He's not a guy who's gonna just go in there and lay down. Both of these matchups, in all honesty, have an air of intrigue because when it comes to Zerto and Vozdik, you know, yeah, Vozdik's coming off a loss, but it's not a foregone conclusion that Zerto has the same success that Artur just had because Zerto's not the puncher that Artur is. He wasn't that big a puncher at super middleweight, much less now that he's at light heavyweight. So even if Artur managed to give Vozdik his first professional loss, don't confuse what Artur can do with what Zerto can do. You know, Zerto's a mid-range to inside guy, just like Artur, but he doesn't pack the same wallop. And if by some chance in the coming weeks and months, let's say Canelo beats Kovalev, wins the WBO title, vacates the WBO title, then the vacant title is on the line in, in what could be Zerto versus Vozdik, well, that gives Vozdik a legitimate opportunity to become a two-time light heavyweight champion because Zerto, Zerto just hasn't convinced me yet that he can really bang with the big boys up there at light heavyweight. He hasn't convinced me. All he's done in this weight class is beat Tommy Carpensi. But you could have gave just about anybody in the top 10 good odds to beat Tommy Carpensi. So in terms of arriving at the weight and making a big splash, Zerto hasn't done that yet. You know that Zerto Ramirez was in attendance for this weekend's light heavyweight matchup. And according to Steve Kim, per Zerto's reps, you know, they're asking for some dollar amounts that just aren't in keeping with reality. That, you know, Zerto wants to be paid certain amounts of money for certain fights. And, and, and he really hasn't established himself yet to where he can ask for those kinds of dollar amounts. And I, I'm going to tell you something about Zerto Ramirez. Whenever his name is brought up, some harsh criticisms tend to follow from the boxing fans for what fights didn't happen in the super middleweight division and how, you know, he was the longest reigning champion of any champion in that weight class, at least based on the recent crop of champions that were there. And, you know, it was an uneventful reign. I mean, the most he did was fight Jesse Hart two times. I'll say that I understand and acknowledge that Zerto's reign as a champion, as WBO champion at 168, it was uneventful, but that wasn't actually his fault. Oh, so? It wasn't. You gotta think about it. You know, boxing fans, they really do got short memories. While Zerto was champion, two of the other world titleists in the weight class were PBC guys. Remember? And we all know how much Top Rank loves doing business with PBC, and PBC loves doing business with Top Rank, right? Huh? It's not like they don't have a strained relationship. You gotta remember. David Benavidez was the WBC champion, James DeGale was the IBF champion, and then it went from James DeGale to Caleb Truax back to James DeGale. Better still, these are all PBC guys. And, you know, the politics of boxing might actually have more to do with why Zerto didn't fight those guys as opposed to Avoiding fights. the way people are making it out to be. That Zerto didn't want those fights or whatever the fucking case is, you know, I don't know what they're implying, but we all know that... PBC and Top Rank, they, they don't got a good relationship. So how do you fault Zerto for what fights didn't happen when we all know that PBC insists on operating as an island? That's not Zerto's fault. You then think about George Groves. George Groves was the WBA champion at the same time that Zerto was the WBO champion. But what's the problem there? After George Groves had won the vacant WBA title by squaring off against Fedor Chudinov, he went right into the World Boxing Super Series after that. And he was all tied up with that up until the point he was beaten by Callum Smith. So Zerto wouldn't have had access to this guy anyway. In many ways, while I understand the criticisms that are levied against Zerto Ramirez's reign as a champion, that it was uneventful, that wasn't exactly his fault. Whereas now that he's a light heavyweight, the ball is in his court. He doesn't have those excuses anymore because it just so happens that many of the big names at light heavyweight are right there on his side of the street. This is his opportunity to not only become a two division champion, but to have a more eventful reign than the one he just had. Because while certain fights not happening at super middleweight isn't directly his fault, 
If he goes up to 175, he starts acting like a princess, he starts acting like a prima donna, demanding certain dollar amounts as if he has this big profile to where he's a household name. Okay, now you're shooting yourself in the foot. We couldn't blame you for what didn't happen at 168, but at 175, that we can blame you for. Because all the big fights, all the best fights with the best fighters, they're right there on your side of the street. So you don't have the politics of boxing to, to rely on as an excuse for certain matchups not happening. In a fight between Zerto and Vozdik, that makes sense. I'll tell you something, you run down an itemized list of matchups that could happen right there on the top rank side of things, and just about any and every name you mention makes sense for Zerto Ramirez. Zerto versus Vozdik makes sense, but so does Zerto versus Anthony Yard. That's a fight that could happen right there under the top rank banner, because we all know Frank B Warren, he's in bed with top rank. So that fight could actually happen, and that's a matchup that makes sense. Two guys that still have things they need to prove. Both of them. That's two matchups right there. Zerto versus Vozdik, Z Zerto versus Yard, Zerto versus Better Beef. Yes, that makes sense. Okay, if, you, if you're not going to fight the best guys at the weight, why are you there? You might as well have stayed at, at, at super middleweight, okay? He should be targeting a guy who has two of the four world titles in the division, okay? These matchups make sense for Zerto. Otherwise, I, I don't even know why the hell he went up there. You might as well have stayed at, at super middleweight. And let, and, you, 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 I don't know, Fort Saunders. Let him challenge you for your title. That would have been the most meaningful fight that Zerto would have been in to date. So, I reiterate, while you can't fault Zerto for what fights didn't happen in the super middleweight division as a result of the politics and the political boundary lines of boxing, while you can't fault him for that, here at light heavyweight, he simply does not have that excuse. And if he gets the hankering to start pricing himself out as if he's something that he's not, he'll have no one else to blame but himself and his team, because Zerto is not yet a household name, and he has not yet established himself as such. So, now that he's stepped up to the light heavyweight division, it's time for him to step up in competition.